that uh, in 2005, I and my wife Malka were one of the myriads of people who went down to try to block the so-called uh, disengagement, but which was really an eviction of Jews from the biblical heartland, uh, Israeli-governed Gaza. The, the word Gaza at, in history meant beautiful beaches, beautiful place. And yet it has come to mean a, a place of jihadism, of repression. And the Israeli government, using the Israeli army, physically kicked us out of Gaza, although we were protesting and begging to stop. Our claims back then were not just centered on a religious outlook. We also said, if you kick us out of Gaza, if there's no Jewish presence here, then what's going to happen is that a Hamas-like entity, whatever it is, it might be the PA, it might be ISIS, it might be Al-Qaeda, something is good, some jihadism is going to take over, and they're going to use this beautiful Gaza as a forward base for an attack on the rest of Israel. And it didn't take too long for that to already happen. Hamas took over quickly. Uh, then they started many, uh, a rocket war against us and a tunneling war, which culminated in the October 7th, massacre where 1200 jews were massacred by a uh, an irregular army partially a, a terrorist army and also an irregular and civilian army that joined in and massacred jews in the uh envelope of the gaza strip in israel including towns like stirot and Tivasra, all those we were right uh, that's what that's what was going to happen and our leadership was blind to it including some leadership that is still in power today uh, that allowed the buildup of a military machine against us in Gaza, allowed money to be funneled into it, uh, and allowed the leadership, the current leadership of Hamas, to be released from Israeli prisons. And Rabbi, the toughest day, day there was indeed when we were when we were protesting in Gaza was indeed the ninth of Av, a time of Jewish calamity, destruction of two temples. And another calamity, which was the destruction of the Jewish communities in Gaza. So I wanted to get your comments on that, what happened then, and the retrospect, how we see uh, the disengagement today, and how do we see it moving forward? The symmetry of catastrophes that recur on Tisha B'Av is actually astonishing. And of course, it points to divine providence, a day set aside for punishment, as the Rambam calls it, Yom Muchan Leparanut. And so many tragedies in Jewish history have taken place on Tisha B'Av, but if we just think about one parallel, which would frighten us, Tisha B'Av in 2005 became the last day of legal Jewish settlement in the Gaza Strip. Tisha B'Av in 1492 was the last day of legal Jewish residence in all of Spain. And on the day after, expulsions commenced from both places. The symmetry should have horrified the people who executed the expulsion from Gush Kativ, but obviously they had no sense of Jewish history, not to mention Jewish destiny. The points that you raise are very well taken because no one has paid any price for the crime of the expulsion from Gush Kativ except the victims. And many people who thought of it, planned it, and executed it, and supported it, are still in positions of power. And even those who are not, are for the most part unrepentant. In truth, I did hear voices after the massacre on Shemini Atzeret of people saying it was a mistake. Most of that was from the common people. Here and there, you'll have a political leader, someone active at the time, who said that uh, obviously it was a big mistake. But just to give an example, and an obscure one, I saw the other night on television, Mayor Shitrit, who at the time was a minister in Likud, and then he left with Sharon to be part of Kadima, and they were the ones who carried out the expulsion from Gaza. And Mayor Shitrit said in 2005, anybody who tells you that our, our, our evacuation from Gaza is going to cause rockets to fall on the heads 
of Israeli citizens is terrifying them for no reason, and he used extremely harsh language to call it utter nonsense. Wow. And I only know this because they played that clip the other night on television, because last week he was at a, one of these protest rallies in Tel Aviv calling for a ceasefire and for the end of the war and for Jews again to leave Gaza and return to the hostages and the overthrow the government, etc. So he has learned nothing. But he's just one example. There are many other examples. And the pain now should be searing that had Jews lived there, this could never have taken place. The foolhardiness of Israeli governments, one after another, and by the way, most of them on the right wing, one after another, allowing Hamas to build and to invest and to there are there aren't as many tunnels in all of Israel as there are in the Gaza Strip, and the fact that this could take place either without the knowledge of the Israeli government or with the knowledge but complicity, it's astonishing. It's mind-boggling, and on Tisha B'Av especially, it's a national tragedy that should cause us all to stay, take stock and wonder how it has come about that we had such leadership. And to take it to the next level, part of the problem is we rely too much on the experts in the military, the so-called security establishment, who are warning us for years that Hamas is deterred and we have nothing to worry about. They don't have the capability of attacking. We should ignore even warning symbols, signals because they mean nothing. And now this is the very same establishment, because no one has been dismissed, the very same establishment that is telling us we can give back the Philadelphia corridor, we can withdraw our troops, we can let them... What are they talking about and why are we listening to them? These are the people who dug us into this hole. And now they're trying to extricate us by saying, let's build an even digger hole for next time. Why they remain in power is absolutely astonishing. And it causes me to question the vaunted intelligence of the Jews. <laughs> Rabbi, uh, f first thing is, um, uh, it's it's great to hear you. And um, I don't know if I said hello to you. I'm not supposed to say hello to you because it's Tisha B'Av. It's a sad day today. Uh, and we have these laws. Uh, before we go on, just I want to ask Yocheved. Yocheved, can you please put on the comment from Central Europe? Somebody was writing from Europe saying that they wanted to uh, visit the land. Oh, so um, the Uralic tribes writes, as a Hungarian Christian from Central Europe, I wish one day to go to Israel on a pilgrimage to go up to the Temple Mount and pray to Hashem. And that's a beautiful, um, beautiful comment. And it goes to show you uh, that we have a lot of friends around the world. We have today a kind of partnership with Hungary as well. We're a nation state. They're a nation state. We're p fighting jihad. jihad. Uh, um, uh, what did I want to call it? Um, what, is, what, what do we call it? an epidemic? That's the, my new word for it. It's the jihad epidemic that's striking Europe and South America. And uh, our Hungarian friends are today allied with us, uh, both both an interest in biblical uh, concepts and also in family and also in anti-jihadism and in, and, in, and in nationalism, Hungarian nationalism, nationalism, Jewish nationalism. And so I want to bless you out there in Hungary. Uh, Rabbi... Hey, um, Jack... I, you're right, there's a jihad epidemic, but most of the West wants to surrender to it. Hungary happens to be one of those countries that will not surrender to it. But the West, including the Americans, want to tell Israel, just, just acquiesce, accommodate, cease fire, and we'll just move on. And you have nothing to worry about. So can you deal with, do you see this question on the screen? It says... Uh, somebody named Isa 87 writes, if the conflict is about jihad, can you explain why the PLO, PFLP, and DFLP were founded by Palestinian Christians? Well, the PFLP was, that was uh, George Chabash. He happened to have been a Christian. The PLO was founded by uh, Muslims. The DFLP, I mean, they've been out of existence for so long, I don't really remember. But yeah, there were some radical uh, Palestinian Arab Christians uh, living in Israel as well. Uh, some have been banished to Lebanon, but Chabash was one of them. He was notorious for terrorist acts 
in the 1970s. But after that, he more or less receded from the scene. And there's no doubt that uh, uh, radical Muslims have taken over even the Palestinian movement. All right, it's true. They say the Palestinian Authority is more or less the moderate uh, brand of uh, uh, enemy of Israel. But that means rather than destroy us immediately, they're content to destroy us over time. You, you, but, know, you, know, you know, Rabbi Brzezinski, I, I have come to a simple uh, a metaphor. The metaphor of two sides of the same coin is exactly true about <clears throat> the P PLO, PA, slash Hamas. It's just a different way of presenting it. One is suit and tie. That's the head side, you know. One is take over the everything. That's the you know tail side. It's it's the same thing. It's just a different way to present it for some pe some people who need to swallow it. For Jewish liberals in New York, you can present the PLO PA and you know give them the suit and tie version of it, and they they'll buy it. You know, I I just there still is amongst Arab Christians a minority that opposes Israel. Most Christians now are supportive of Israel, and the uh, the caller should note that, th for example, the Christian population of Bethlehem has dwindled dramatically since it came under the rule of the Palestinian Authority. From a, a town, Bethlehem is a classically Christian city. It was 80% Christian. Now it's about 5% Christian. And most of these Christians have fled the land of Israel entirely because they could not tolerate living under these radical Muslims. They hate Christians as much as they hate Jews. And in the motto that they use frequently, First, they will come after the Saturday people, meaning us, Shabbat, and then they will come after the Sunday people. So their war for the supremacy of Islam is against all believers in the Bible. Rabbi Stephen Przanski, I have actually some video right now. You said that the Hungarians are uh, fighting uh, to keep their Hungarian state from, from an influx of jihadism. Uh, in England, there's a battle right now uh, in the streets where... How I understand, patriotic Britons are pushing back against uh, a jihad. What, what was the uh, what was the term we use? Uh, epidemic. Check, right. Take a look at this video of Nigel Farage on Fox. Let's see it. To prosecute anybody who is posting about it. Can you walk us through what's going on? Yeah, I mean two things. Firstly, the violent disorder. Terrible division in our cities. Uh, we've got parts of our inner city now that have become completely Muslim dominated. Uh, and that has led to a lot of British people saying, what the hell's going on? Um, our country is changing fundamentally. We've had successive general elections in which the Conservatives, following Labour, promised to reduce immigration numbers, yet we saw them double and then quadruple to record numbers. Uh, we have a border crisis like you of these boats coming across the English Channel. So underneath all of this, underneath all of this, yes, you've got Muslims, Muslim, Muslim extremists, you've got some far right, you know, yobs, violent people who look for an excuse, but behind it is a growing sense of unease in our country that we're losing our identity. And that is what led to that explosion of violence the other day. Now, this is the most serious violence we've had since the Black Lives Matter protests in the wake, of course, of the murder of George Floyd back in 2020. Funny enough, Sir Keir Starmer, our Prime Minister, at the time of the Black Lives Matter riots, when police were being injured, when historical monuments were being torn down, he chose to take the knee in solidarity with the aims of those who were out doing the protesting and causing the violence. But now the boots on the other foot. Now it's seen to be white working class British people that are protesting. And by the way, I'm not defending violence in any way of at course. all. No, now he wants to take control of the narrative. Now look, nobody should use any social media platform. All right, I think that's clear enough. Uh, the bottom line is that Britons are also fighting right now for the identity of England, of English identity. And uh, they're, they're, they're pushing back hard. The media, by the way, it's a, almost a media blackout on what's going on out there in England. Uh, but uh, he, here's another country. I, I want to tell you, Rabbi, that I've spoken to our politicians and I've said, listen, there is a, just like there is on the other side, there's a green, red axis, uh, which is, you know, progressivism and jihadism. Uh, on our side, there is a alliance 
of nationalism, pro-Bible, pro-defense, pro-family, anti-jihad, and we should see ourselves as aligned with Hungary, Poland, um, Argentina, and, and other countries like that, the parts of America that are like that. Uh, and and I've tried to say to them, listen, let's 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 co let's coalesce a little bit. Let's have a coalition. But they don't they don't see that exactly. They don't they don't. I, I think they have no, you know, no. the provincial. They're, they're no they have no sense of an international order that's trying to fight this pandemic. Right. Well, Farage has his finger on the problem. And as you noted, throughout Europe, there are these anti-immigration uh, parties that are gaining in strength in Poland, in Hungary, in uh, the UK. But I think what has to be realized, it's not just an influx of people who not only refuse to assimilate, but refuse really to even have show respect for the nation into which they have entered. It's more than that. I think the real problem is that the West has to understand the radical Muslims have become expert in exploiting democracy in order to weaken that very democracy and ultimately to take it over. In an American context, it's actually uh, quite apparent. Whenever a Muslim does anything, you can't criticize it because the crowd of Islamophobia is raised right away. Everything is Islamophobic. To say that uh, even you should scrutinize terrorists coming into the country or an airport, Islamophobic. That you should even point out that a particular terrorist, whether in San Bernardino or in Orlando, was a Muslim, Islamophobic. So they've learned how to use the terminology of the West in appealing to our respect for individual rights and human dignity in order to use it as a club against us. When Lenin said that the the cap that they would sell the capitalists the rope with which they would hang themselves, you could take that analogy that he used and apply it in these cases as well. What we're basically doing is using the positive aspects of democracy, the virtues of democracy, in order to completely undermine it. And as England is being overwhelmed. The U.S. is really being overwhelmed, many parts as well. And you see the, the two sides in America, how immigration is such a big issue in the present campaign, but elsewhere in Europe, Germany, Italy, some places have given up because yeah. they, they, they see the conflict between cracking down and what they hold to be these democratic virtues that they have. So in fact, ultimately, those virtues will be completely eradicated. So they'll go down feeling good about themselves, but they'll go down nonetheless. So so the people that are that are that are that are using these principles <clears throat> to let jihadism in, they're anything but liberal. They're that's, anything but democratic. That's and that's correct. what's so ironic about it all. You're like you're like opening up the the hen house for the wolf to come in, for the fox to come in. And the right. fox says no, 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 none of those values that you espouse by bringing them in. You know, there are there are so many parameters that I'm not happy with. There are so many variables that I'm not happy with that we're not all not happy with. The jihadists take over, uh, and the Iranian chess pieces of of their proxies in South Lebanon, in Gaza. Now, surprise, surprise, they're starting to take over Jordan and in Yemen. In the Houthis, and there's like a noose. I don't want to mix metaphors, but there's these chess pieces, this noose coming around us, you know. And and I, I you know, and, and Israel is so much smaller than I than when when I was born. Uh, it's about seventy percent smaller physically. So there's many parameters that are bothersome. On the other hand, our peoplehood is growing, the economy is stronger, and the best news is, I think that the young people of Israel are tending towards more Torah, more love of Israel, of the land, more fighting, pushing back against bad guys, more what we would call nationalism or right wing. Uh, and and so and that's an amazing tendency, which is against all the, you know, all the other efforts to brainwash them away. So I wanted to ask, that's how I see it. How do you see it? This Tisha B'Av, you were at the Western Wall, you saw the singing but at the same time, Jews were killed. Just just a day ago, two Jews were killed. One in a stabbing, or what, was it a stabbing in the Bikater then, or a shooting? I'm not sure exactly what happened there. What's that? It was it was a shooting where this Yonatan uh, Deutsch, 
right? That, that's, that was his name, Yonatan Joyce? Uh, drive by shooting that gets no attention from the West. And he was, you know what? He was, uh, you know what? I'm going to take a second to call up the, uh, I'm just going to call it up for a second. I just want people to see this, this guy. Just give me one second and I'll, 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 uh, I'll bring it up. Um, here it is. Um, just one second. There it is. This young, this young man was, was murdered and it's yeah, just such a, what's that? He served for months in Gaza. He had just been discharged. Second. Only to be killed a few miles from his home. This is uh, this is the the uh, the Times of Israel has a lot of different stories. One second they they tricked me here a little bit. Um, here it is. Here's the story that I wanted to show. Can you see this, Rabbi? Can you see this uh, young man, a 23 year old? He was he was he was he had left the army for a few days to get engaged, uh, and then was uh, cut down. And there was a 19-year-old soldier who was also shot uh, and killed in, in battle in Gaza. So there's so many parameters that are hard, so hard. Uh, but there are some parameters that are amazing. So I wanted to ask you, what's – oh, and, and, and before you answer, before you answer, one more phrase, which is a rabbi once told me that only prophets of Israel can really tell us what's going on because only they can see through God's prophecy the greater – it's a rough cookie and phrase, which is only the prophets can see the what's the greater tendency of our generation. And so uh, you'll have to take the role of prophet here to okay. tell me what uh, what, like, what what the status is. All right. A shout out to Hillary from Tenafly. That's right. Hillary is my she is my sister in law. God bless you, Hillary. Oh. Uh, and that's right. And <laughs> and I just spent a wonderful time at her house in Tenafly. And God bless you, Hillary and, and my and the whole family. God bless you. It actually Go ahead, Rabbi, your answer goes back to what you said right before I came on when someone asked you who the who do you want to be the leader of Israel and you said it has to be someone from a new generation this is a generation this young generation that people had belittled as materialistic as uh, unprincipled as just interested in money and a good time and as soon as tragedy befell Israel and the Jewish people they rose like lions and put their lives and families behind them to sacrifice everything for the greater good. The leaders have to come from that generation. And, you know, I was sitting in shul this morning, and, like, it, it struck me, listen to Torah that I've heard now dozens and dozens of times, the very end, it's the prophetic reading from this morning, Jeremiah 9, 22, 23. And I just heard the words, and I said to myself, this is our generation, and this is the solution to our problems. So God says, Let not the wise man lord himself with his wisdom, and let not the strong man lord himself with his strength, and let not the rich man lord himself with his wealth. And I thought to myself, that's the problem in Israel. For how long have we been lording ourselves that we're so wise. We know what the enemy is going to do. We rank so high in the OECD in our uh, scholastic achievements. We know better than everyone. And so let not the strong man lord himself with his strength. And we say to ourselves, oh, we have the most powerful army in the Middle East. And we don't even have to guard the borders because we have the sophisticated technology that's going to do it for us. And we're so powerful that the enemy will never attack us. And let not the rich man lord himself with his wealth. And we have such a high standard of living here. And we're the high-tech capital of the world, Silicon Valley. And people want to invest in Israel. And the economy is doing well even with the war. So we pride ourselves on our wisdom, on our strength, on our wealth. And you know what? God says, don't do that. That's a mistake. That should not define the Jewish people. You know what should define the Jewish people? This is what you should lord yourself for. Be intelligent. Know me. Try to understand. I am a God who does kindness, justice, and righteousness in the land. Knowledge of God. Study of Torah. 
observance of mitzvot that lead to a society that is permeated with kindness and justice and righteousness, for in these is my desire, says God. That's what God wants from us. If you ask me to look to the future, and you said it in the context of your question, it's a generation that is reconnecting with its roots, a generation that wants to be more engaged with the tradition, both in terms of the ideas and the practices. That's Haskel the Adoa Oti. God says, use your intelligence. Know me. Know why I put you in this land. Know why I destroyed the temple twice on this day. Know why I exiled you twice from this land, one exile lasting 19 centuries. And know why I have brought you back to the land. It's not to make this computer chip or even the Iron Dome. It's that you should be a holy moral society. And when you do that, you'll have a society with pride before whom our enemies will cower, will be the envy of the world, and even more, will be a light unto the nations of the world. Rabbi Stephen Przanski, I want to really bless you uh, for a meaningful end of the fast. Uh, as Linda says, amen, Rabbi. I say the same. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for joining us.